Thank you so much, Anna. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, despite the awesome weather that we have today. Um, so today, as Hannah already said, we're going to talk about humanoid robots and the uh, phenomena of Uncanny Valley. Here you see a couple of robot images. Um, they're supposed, some of them are supposed to creep you out. Um, especially the one on the left does creep me out. Um, they all look like human, but they miss something that we can immediately recognize. Um, I'm going to start this presentation with a couple of questions. So let's look at these two robots that are quite similar in terms of design. Which of them do you find more easy to look at? I don't know if that's the same for you. The one on the right seems a bit off. What about these two Android robots? Which of them is a bit eerie? Which of them is more easy to look at? Again, the one on the left side comes much more closer to a real human. It looks more realistic, more natural, whereas the one on the right, something again seems to be off. And now, these were just some images. I want to show you some videos. It's just Erica and me. Canada, may I ask your name? My name is Ben. My name is Erica. It's a pleasure to meet you, Ben. You too. Would you like to hear a little about me? Yes, please. I was created to be the world's most advanced and most beautiful, fully autonomous android. Sitting here with Erica feels a bit disconcerting and unnatural. I know she's not a person, but I can't help looking into her eyes, which must be because she looks human. Erica's facial expressions are created by dozens of pneumatic air cylinders. They act like muscles embedded beneath her silicon skin. All right, so the robot looked very similar to a human, but did it move like a human? Absolutely not, right? So as soon as the robot started moving, again, we had that feeling of uneasiness. It sounded like a human, but it didn't necessarily move like a human. Now let's watch another robot that is not necessarily very similar to humans, but moves much better than Erica. Okay, so um, that was supposed to be the most expressive robot <laughs> currently developed in the world called Ameka robot. Um, the facial expressions came very close to humans, but it's still, I don't feel easy watching this robot move. So all the feelings that we've been experiencing so far, uh, they go under the um, effect of uncanny valley. They are termed as uncanny valley because um, there is something that does not necessarily click for the humans and um, the uncanny valley hypothesis tells us that generally when a, an object, a doll, a mannequin, a robot, an animated uh, virtual human comes close to human, it becomes more real it looks more real, behaves more real, we start having a positive reaction to it, but to a point. That point is where it becomes too creepy. It's almost human, but not yet human per se. So that's where the response becomes negative. We no longer have a uh, sense of acceptance or likability toward the uh, agent that we are watching. And I showed you images of the robots. I also showed you movies of the robots. And I expected you to find a difference between the feelings that you experienced there. 
because the uncanny valley hypothesis posits that for the static images, normally the valley is weaker than for the moving agents. So there is something about the uh, biological motion that is very important for the human brain. And if something looks human but does not move like a human, then you get a stronger negative response toward it. Now, let's talk about the history of Uncanny Valley. Uncanny Valley was first termed by, uh, was, was coined by a Japanese roboticist called Masahiro Mori in 1970. Uh, where he wrote about this negative feeling that people experienced as they started interacting or watching uh, objects that look like humans. On the x-axis of this hypothetical curve, what you see is the similarity to human. That's the original curve that he uh, uh, put forward in the documents of, uh, in, in his notes then. On the left side of this x-axis, there is the machine likeness, and on the right side is the human likeness. On the y-axis, however, what he termed was Shinbakan. That is a word in Japanese that we don't have a direct translation for, but what comes close to it is familiarity, uh, affinity, or these days the term that is used, likability. Um, and then he described that once you start um, having more similar objects shown to viewers, there will be a point that they enter Bukimi no Tani. The Tani means the valley here, and Bukimi is the equivalent of uncanniness, eeriness. So that was the uh, original hypothesis then. However, this was just based on Murray's observations, his own anecdotal uh, examples. Since then, the question is, do we have empirical evidence for this? Can we find the same thing with research? So a research that was done in 2016 collected 80 real world robot faces and they had people rank these mechanical and human like uh, looking uh, robots according to, the, uh, to their realisticness to their human likeness. So they would basically hire a group of participants, ask them, can you rate these robots on how much human likeness you perceive from them? And once they ranked these robots according to the human likeness, they showed it to another group of participants in a follow-up study where they had to rate their perception of likability. On the x-axis, you see the, uh, the, the face numbers. So from the very mechanical uh, looking uh, robots uh, to the very human like uh, looking robots. And on the y-axis, you see the uh, rating of the likability that was given to them. We do see a small uh, valley effect there. It's not as strong as Mori hypothesized, but there is at least some um, decrease of likability as the uh, robots that people watched moved from mechanical looking to human-like looking. And then they did something interesting, a behavior uh, test with the participants where they did an investment game with uh, the robot. They were told that you were supposed to do an investment game with the robot that you watched before you. The investment game goes as uh, a, a portion of money, an amount of money is given to you. You can decide what part of it you want to give to the robot. And then the robot decides to, um, for example, triple it or double it and give it back to you. So the question was, do people trust this seen robot with their money? Do they believe that the robot will be trustworthy enough to give their uh, investment back? And again, they replicated a similar curve it's not as strong as the valley they saw with the likability, but still with the very human-like robots, people were willing to invest. With the mechanical-looking uh, robots, people were willing to invest. It was just those robots that were not yet human enough that people did not trust much. Okay, so the question is, is it only the robots that give us such creepy feeling? So, so far we saw that um, there is some empirical evidence from research to research, it differs how much of um, the valley strength we see in the responses. But the uh, test bed these days for the uncanny valley research is actually the digital humans. Uh, with the advancement of the computer generated faces, we have lots of agents around us 
well, for which we can actually try to understand the effect of Uncanny Valley, how it is produced, why people respond to these spaces the way they do, and what we can do to prevent it. That's the most important question for us. What can we do to prevent that feeling of creepiness and eeriness when people work with these agents? Um, for example, here what you see is an agent that is developed by a um, known company, Soul Machine. Uh, the agent is called Mike. It's a replica of a real human. However, again, as the agent talks, although the appearance is really, really human-like, um, we as the observer can tell this is not a real human. Something, again, with the movement, the eyes, the skin is off, that tells it away. And this is a very important thing for the, um, uh, the, the motion pictures industry, for the healthcare industry, because we are seeing that these agents are becoming more frequently used in different training and um, uh, healthcare scenarios. For example, here on top left, you see two agents that are used in mental healthcare. They can represent a real human to whom you can uh, start conversing with and you can um, discuss your problem and receive some recommendations. On the right side you see an agent being used in customer services and at the bottom you see these virtual agents being used in education of nursing students. And then it goes beyond that. It's also uh, far more used in the film industry, in the entertainment industry, uh, industry with the very uh, early avatars, uh, digital humans, being uh, used in, in animated uh, uh, cartoons and animations. Um, we all remember the movie Shrek from 2001, Princess Fiona being very human-like then with the technology they had. Apparently, the story goes that Fiona was even more human-like than was in the final cut of the movie. However, when they uh, pilot run the movie with some children, some of them started crying because the character was too human-like and it scared them off. Um, I don't know why I stopped. So they had to reduce the level of human likeness of the character. And then um, as time goes by, um, the technology has improved. And these days we see lots of movies that use animated uh, characters. And it comes to this 2019 movie, uh, Alita. Some of us may have uh, watched the movie. Um, in my view, it was a uh, the Alita character went beyond Uncanny Valley. We were able to watch the movie without feeling that creepiness that uh, stopped us from watching further. As you could see, the fine grain details of the face were simulated really well in this case. And that meant that um, somehow this movie could make a success uh, because the characters were not repulsive to the viewers. So um, I think the entertainment story has the most um, uh, probably benefit from the advancement of these digital humans. And that's where most of the investment goes. But then I also think it's not just the robots and uh, digital humans. Humans can be uncanny too. This is a famous uh, video that went viral. Um, where facial expressions and the movements of the body do not match uh, what is um, normally a human like uh, biological motions. And this sometimes happens uh, with real humans as well, mainly because there is ingenuity of emotions um, or there is um, a, a situation that does not necessarily, the context does not match the response. So in that um, uh, situation, what happens is that facial expressions and the movements are not a match 
um, some part of the face respond in one way and part of the face responds in another way. The best example is a smiling. They say a genuine smile is the one that um, goes hand in hand with the eyes and the, and the mouth. So if you are uh, making a smile action without your eyes actually smiling, then that comes across as an uncanny uh, facial expression. Okay, so that's where we are, different examples of Uncanny Valley, why it's important to be studied. And um, the question now is that how can we uh, measure and investigate Uncanny Valley? Beyond um, the, uh, the measurement, what lies at the foundation of it is um, how can we explain the mechanism that derives this? What is the explanation then? There are a couple of theories that have been developed over time um, to explain why Uncanny Valley uh, happens as it does. Um, some of these uh, uh, theories are just theories without empirical evidence. Some of them have been already um, sort of validated with empirical research. I'm gonna just tell you about uh, what the idea is behind each of these uh, theories, and then we're going to discuss, we're going to see some of the studies that have been um, uh, researched in the past. So the evolutionary theory um, tells us that uncanny valley is an effect because of our response to um, uh, the, the uh, living beings uh, as part of like our evolution wanting to distinguish between uh, threat and non-threat. So um, if a human is, for example, physically damaged, or if there is emotional, uh, like uh, ill intention of some of the people, what happens is that there will be a difference between the, uh, a mismatch between the physiological attributes or a mismatch between the behavior and the appearance of the human beings. So the evolutionary theory tells us that the response we are generating toward these objects that look like human but are not yet human is because we are so much tuned to differentiate between what is uh, less risky and um, a friend human than uh, what is a threat and risky um, object around us. A, a good example of this is, uh, for example, the response you show to the corpses, um, zombies in the movie. So these kind of signify illness um, and, um, and a, you know, a, a signal of death that comes across. The categorization ambiguity theory tells us that our brain wants to put things into categories. So when I see something for the first time, I want to tell whether this is a living being or this is an object. And with this uncanny, um, almost human, but not human objects, what happens is that our brain is confused. We cannot really put them in one box. And that's where the negative response arises. The cognitive dissonance theory is based on the prediction that happens in the brain. Our brain is um, normally tuned into predicting the, uh, what is supposed to be the outcome of already uh, categorized or known um, object. So if I see an object that looks like mechanic, I expect it to behave mechanically. If I see an animated, um, um, if I see a real human, I expected it to uh, behave like a real human. And if the two uh, do not match, so what happens is that I see an object that looks like mechanical, but moves like a human or the other way around, um, I, the prediction in my brain, uh, there is an error in the prediction in my brain. So that results into a cognitive dissonance that conflicts the brain. And then the perceptual mismatch theory is very similar to the cognitive dissonance. And what it tells us is that um, there needs to be uh, the sensory information you gather from what you see um, needs to be in, 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 in congruency. So for example, if you put a larger eyes on a face that does not match a real human eye size, what happens is that you get a negative response toward that. There is a perceptual mismatch there. And then what needs to be uh, remembered is that these theories are not mutually exclusive. So it's not like one of them explains um, uh, uncanny valley and the rest can be invalidated. Perhaps the best explanation is a combination of all these theories. 
Um, where do I come in in this uh, research? So I happen to do my PhD research in a, a laboratory that work with very human-like robots. So the, uh, the lab uh, developed a lot of human-like machines, human-like robots. Uh, Erica that you saw was a product of that laboratory. Some of you might have seen geminoid robots in the past. They are replica of a real human. Um, telenoid is a minimal human with minimalistic human-like features that is uh, expected to work as a, as a teleoperated robot, particularly for older adults. Um, and then a number of other Android robots that were on the market at the time. Um, yeah. So um, the original work from this lab looked at how Android robots can be used as a test bed for um, embodiment and the feeling of uncanny valley. The idea, and this is something that was published in 2008 by the PI of the lab, Ishiguro, uh, the idea was that these robots that we are developing that are very close to human kind of um, go beyond the uncanny valley. So what you see there, the small robot, is actually a replica of Ishiguro's daughter. That was the first robot he ever did, and it happened to be a failure because it looked like a zombie eventually. Apparently, it even scared people in the laboratory. And then they considered it to drop into the valley. And the next version of the robots they did, and that's, I think, in 2006, they consider it to be a better a robot that already went beyond the valley. And their evidence for that was um, an experiment they did. They put the robot behind curtains. Um, they invited participants to come to the lab. They would remove the curtain for three seconds and then ask people, what did you see, a human or uh, the robot? Um, and you should know that the robot was a replica of a real human, and they um, required a lot of assistance from the model uh, with their experiment. So in every experiment, the actual human was there, the robot was there too, and they repeated this experiment with, uh, I think, at the time, 70-something people. Um, what they found was that if both the robot and the human sat still, did nothing, especially the robot, all, everything, all the machines were off, they were switched off. People would, could be, uh, the people were able to tell which one was robot, which one was real human. However, when the Android started having this subconscious movements, such as eye blinking, they also simulated the, uh, the breathing um, motions. Uh, because um, the robot was moving with pneumatic uh, um, actuators that looked like a muscle, so they would just like um, create this inhaling and exhaling movement. When they endowed the robot with such subconscious, really micro movements, then people were not able to tell which one was human and which was not, which was with the android. So in, in that case, they, they consider that with, within that three-second observation, the robot already went beyond the valley. People were not able to tell the difference with a real human. However, this is the robot that we're talking about. Let's look at the movements beyond three seconds. As you can see, there is a lot of jitter in the movement. And uh, indeed, uh, we cannot say that the robot so the, uh, the claim that was made at the time that this robot went beyond the uh, valley uh, only limited um, itself to very short period of interaction and exposure. So another researcher in the lab decided to do a study on the um, interaction between biological movement movement in general with the appearance of the robot. So they wanted to know what is it that with this robot in terms of appearance and, and, and behavior. So remember, Uncanny Valley, it um, explains the, uh, the repulsive, the negative reaction, both when the agent is still and dynamic. So in this case, uh, we saw the effect when it was dynamic, and the question was that, wh wh why is this happening? Where in the brain can we find the mechanism that explains this? So um, they created three conditions in an experiment where 
a human did a couple of movements, the same human that the robot was replicated from. Then they created the same movement for the android. And in a third condition, they repeated the android movements, but this time skinned the robot. So they removed the, the skin of the robot so that the robot would look mechanic. And what they found was that within the human action perception system in the brain, which is where you actually process biological movement, the response that the brain shows toward mechanical looking robots and the real humans is almost similar. However, for the mechanical looking robot, uh, for the real human looking robot with the mechanical motion, there is an, a strengthened uh, response. So the response goes uh, stronger. And the explanation for that, they pin it on predictive coding, um, the same uh, theory we talked about, similar to cognitive dissonance, that there was a prediction of uh, motion for a real human, but what the eye saw was a mechanical uh, movement, and hence the brain is trying to make sense of it, hence more neural activity. And then they did in a follow-up study, also they uh, looked at the responses in the frontal area with respect to error prediction. Uh, what they found was that when people watched the, um, the Android with, uh, with, uh, with its movement being mechanical, so the real Android with the skin, but with uh, mechanical movement, the N400 response, which is a response that normally arises uh, uh, when you detect an error, um, that went stronger compared to the, uh, the mechanical looking robot working mechanical movements and the real human doing the real uh, movements. Then another researcher um, wanted to know whether this effect goes beyond behavior and appearance. So um, this was a very interesting question that uh, the research team at the time had. They wanted to know what about the attitude and behavior of the robot? Does that affect the uncanny valley or not? They designed an experiment in which two robots, one looking very mechanical and the other one the android, which is human-like, they were endowed with personality. So, uh, and they had to do a long-term interaction in terms of three sessions. What they did was that they simulated a situation where the uh, participant was interviewed for a job um, and the, the robot uh, represented the interviewer. Um, and then in one scenario, the robot had a positive personality um, trying to make it more comfortable for the participant and the other one, the robot had a negative personality. So the robot would actually, for example, in response to questions that what is your weakness, the robot would um, nod very negatively and say, oh, really, uh, is that true? Some, uh, some, some responses like that. And then what they found was that the behavior of the robot actually did impact the likability of the robot over time. And this was more strong for the uh, mechanical looking robot. Um, so when the robot was positive, people expected it to be likable uh, over the interactions. When the robot was acting negatively, the likability of the mechanical looking robot dropped significantly. This effect was a smaller both for positive and negative behavior was a smaller for the Gemino. So they interpreted this, that the uncanny valley for the Geminoid is persistent. Um, even over multiple interactions with the robot, even uh, with the impact of the uh, attitude and behavior of the robot, the likability of the robot doesn't change much as um, it does for the mechanical looking robot. So they argued that um, we have to consider when we're talking about the Maurice curve, the hypothetical curve, we have to consider the attitude and um, probably the values is still there, but with positive and the negative attitude and personality of the robot during the interaction, um, where the uh, likability lies might change. So um, to um, summarize it, the value is still going to be there. It's a matter of whether it's a complete negative reaction or a less likable reaction. And then that um, ex 
experience I had in the lab translated in my contribution to a project that was done at Tilburg University. It concluded uh, last, last, last December. Um, the project is, uh, was called WIPE. Um, and uh, the goal of the project was to create virtual avatars that can be used in healthcare. So um, in partnership with uh, Breda University of Applied Sciences and 12 other uh, institutes, the goal of the project was to first create these virtual avatars um, using some technology, state-of-the-art technology of photogrammetry. Um, the idea was that let's create um, these digital humans that look like a real human, uh, be able to uh, create facial expressions and movements for them, and above all, be able to actually implement them in healthcare scenarios for training purposes, for interaction purposes, and uh, see what kind of perception and um, uh, response we can gather from um, different patient groups. This work that I'm going to present to you was majorly done by a PhD student at the time who recently graduated, um, Julia Veitinati. Um, and uh, her part of work in this project was focused on face perception. So what is important with respect to face development when we're talking about digital humans um, that um, creates the sense of realism and naturalness? And that's the million dollar question. If we can find the features that define the, um, the, the negative and positive responses, they can predict what sort of responses people show to the faces, then we can use those features to create better virtual human and virtual faces. So um, where we embarked on was um, we knew at the time, so it, this was year 2019, if I remember correctly, um, where we embarked on the question that, okay, we do have a lot of digital humans right now um, that are being developed by different uh, companies. But the question is, are they beyond the valley or not? And by beyond the valley, what I mean is that, can they uh, be perceived as a human? Can people no longer differentiate between them and a real human? So we formulated the question as, are these agents processed like humans? And you can see some of them that were developed at the time by some of the big uh, tech companies. We wanted to approach this question from three different perspectives. First, the perception of the viewer. Do people see them similarly as they do? Um, with a human face, so they, they no longer can uh, uh, recognize which one is which. Do they memorize these faces differently? So we do have uh, quite extensive cognitive research that tells us that our memory of faces is better than memory of any other stimuli. We are tuned, our brain is tuned to memorize uh, faces uh, because of evolutionary benefits it had for us. Um, so we had this question, do they um, kind of stimulate the same memory encoding that real human faces do. And then the last uh, angle we wanted to look at this question was through neurophysiology. Does the brain respond to these faces the same way it responds to real human faces? And then what we did is that we collected um, all the state of the art for the realistic virtual agents that were available then on the internet, we collected their images. We also borrowed images from an available data set where uh, actual humans were photographed. And then we created, we sort of like manipulated the images to only keep the face, remove all the other, uh, like the hair and other confounds of the picture. And we showed people these images one by one and asked them to rate it. So this is, for example, a very simple task that we gave to the participants. One by one, we showed them um, different images. So um, this one is from a real human. This one you should already know from the previous slide. This is an agent. And people were asked to rate how much they agree with this image being a human. And this is the result we got. This became very interesting for us. Uh, because we noticed that for the human faces, people were quite capable of telling this is a human. 
And then for virtual agents, it was also quite easy for them to tell um, this is not a human. So they rated it lower than they would for the real human. As you can see, um, although the curve here goes higher, there is a substantial difference with the highest rating that is given for the actual humans and for the IVA being the intelligent virtual uh, avatars in this case. And then we took all the responses, all the participants that gave the highest response to these images, and we rated the percentage of the rating, the highest rating they got. So here on this uh, uh, slide, you see the number, the percentage of times our participants said they, uh, mo they, 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 um, they uh, most strongly agree with the face being a human. And um, as we rank them based on the percentage, we notice the difference between these images. With these uh, images on top, receiving the lowest percentage being very doll-like, um, very, uh, you know, low level uh, in terms of graphical features. And then these images on the bottom row being quite um, uh, detailed in terms of the facial features. And that's where we started thinking about Okay, we, we have this collection of images. We know which of them are perceived most human-like and which of them least human-like. Let's start doing a computational analysis that tells us, that gives us those features that uh, uh, influence people's perception the most. From a computational analysis we did, we found two features that most uh, that were most contributing to the perception of human likeness. One of them was the number of corneal reflections that was simulated in the eyes of the virtual avatar. And the second one was the skin texture. So if I go back to this image, the agents on top row, they have a smoother skin. It's so smooth, it looks uh, unnatural. And they had either no corneal reflection or lesser corneal reflection that was present for the agents here. These agents at the bottom, they had more detailed skin texture. The pores, the, um, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the pores and the uh, different uh, details of the uh, skin was present there. So we thought that, okay, now we need to study um, the, so we had some hypothesis here that these two features could be the most contributing one, but we wanted to empirically test this. And because we didn't have all those agents at the time at hand to be able to manipulate these features the way we wanted, we took another approach. We said, okay, so we don't have the agents to um, move them from like low realism to high realism, what we can do is we can take real human faces and handicap them. So move from the other side of the uncanny valley, see whether removal of those features from the real human face will uh, decrease the acceptability and likability of the face. So that's what we did. So we either reduce the skin texture of a real human face or remove the corneal reflection. These are our experimental stimuli. On top left, you see the human faces that we had at hand on alter. And then what we did is that we either removed the uh, corneal reflections in the eyes. So those are the, um, the whites in the, um, in the eye that you can see are removed. Um, in another stimuli category, we kind of smoothened the skin. So we removed all the pores um, and the details of the skin. And in one condition, we did both. So we changed both features. And then this time, again, we showed it to people and asked them to tell us whether what they saw was a human or not. And what we found was that when the face was not changed, so when the corneal reflection and skin texture was intact, people could uh, very, with high accuracy tell this was a human. When both were changed, they could also tell accurately this is not a human. However, when only eyes were changed or only skin texture were changed, people were confused. People no longer could accurately, accurately tell whether this is a human or not, showing that 
um, each of these features on their own matter a lot when it comes to uh, realism perception. So, uh, and, and another finding we had was that race and gender were influenced, influential factors in this perception. So people were more accurate in telling the difference between an agent, uh, between an altered face and unaltered face when the seen face was, from their, was with their own, uh, from their own race. So the majorities, they more easily told the difference for the Caucasian faces than for other, for example, Asian or black faces, and that um, it was easier to tell apart the male faces compared to the female faces. And we think the um, explanation here is that females are more likely to change the skin texture, to wear makeup, and it's um, um, sort of like uh, more common for people to see such differences between um, the real skin and the altered skin. So that was the, uh, the conclusion of the study that we did, where we found that the realism of the face lies in the skin and eyes of the, uh, of the agent. And we made recommendation for future developers that if you really want to have a very realistic looking, very natural looking agent, uh, for different application domains, these are the two features you have to focus on. Then for the second study that we did, we were interested in the memory of the faces. Now we want to find a cognitive explanation um, whether these two faces, so we know that the perception uh, is influenced by these two factors. Now we want to know at the cognitive level, does the uh, response to these images uh, change? based on the manipulations that we did to the faces. So again, in two studies, uh, one with the real human faces altered and unaltered, and the other one with the virtual agents, what we did was we showed the faces to humans first. They had to just watch 48 images. And then they did a distractor task where they sort of spent time on something for time to pass. And then we did a test phase where they had to once again watch the images and then decide whether they had seen it before or not. In this study phase, in this test phase, what we did is that we took a subset of what they already saw with new faces. So some of them they had seen before and some of them they did not. And we wanted to know um, how much of them did they remember. Uh, what we found was that both of the features did affect the memory of the faces. And um, the feature that was most likely to um, make the memory of the face poorer uh, was the lack of corneal reflection. So the eyes give it all. The eyes are the most important thing when you're encoding faces in your memory. Um, if the eyes are natural and are, are unnatural, then the cognitive processes for that face are um, not the same as when you're looking at the human faces. So um, there is uh, a complication, a complexity of uh, processing there. And then uh, when we wanted to go beyond uh, memory and perception into the brain, we started by asking what is the evidence there with respect to Uncanny Valley? Do we have an answer um, to the question whether there are measurements, uh, there are measures, metrics in the brain that explain Uncanny Valley? I already showed you two studies that had done it, but we wanted to know what is the landscape, what is the state of the art? So we did a scoping review of um, 15 years of research where we looked at all the uh, neuroimaging studies, including EEG, fMRI, FNIRS studies that uh, tried to explore uncanny valley in the brain. Among all the records we found, only 13 studies actually did what we were looking for. So that showed how little research had been done in terms of neurophysiological responses to or um, um, neural responses to the uh, uncanny valley. And these, um, the summary of all these 13 studies that we gathered in a paper was that we probably know where in the brain the uncanny valley response shows up. And that is a place in the brain uh, called fusiform face area, which is responsible 
for face perception and face recognition. Uh, and what we found was that this area was lighted up, was activated less when people were watching artificial faces. So real humans activate this area, uh, real human faces activate this area differently than artificial faces does. But what was not present in all these studies that we reviewed was the um, uh, was an understanding of the temporal response. So when is it exactly that after you look at an image, you decide, your brain decides that, well, wait, this is not a human. And the uh, background of this question is that uh, within milliseconds of us, we humans, seeing another human face, our brain already can tell whether what we saw was a human or an object. That is the categorical perception, right? We talked about that. That we are very quick in telling that what I see is a real human face or a non-human. And research shows that those faces that we have seen actually um, uh, make this response strong and stronger. So the memory of the face also is a factor here. However, no research had told us whether it's the very early responses at the level of 100 to 200 milliseconds after we wash the face that tells us this is an artificial face, or is it the later responses when we have more time to process all those details that we already found a perceptual difference for, right? So um, this became the research question that Julia um, embarked on, whether we find an early response um, being different between the two phase categories or the later responses. So here is the study that she did. Um, she collected EEG responses. These are the electrical potential that you collect with a cap of electrodes over the scalp. Uh, people sat in front of a monitor and similar to the memory experiment, they just watched faces passing by. And the faces they watched were either human faces or the virtual agents that we had found and manipulated. And here is the result we found. We did not see any difference in terms of N170 or P200 being the early responses toward the uh, faces, but we did see a difference um, toward the two categories of the images in later responses around 400 to 600 milliseconds. So this actually told us that in terms of face perception, the, the, the quickest response you have to this artificial face is that it's human-like. It's a human. It falls in the category of the human. It's later that your brain starts looking at the mismatches, right? So um, kind of this evidence uh, uh, goes toward the, uh, so sort, sort of supports the theory of uh, perceptual mismatch. That now I, I don't find it necessarily the same way that I expect a human face to be. Um, now, the final slide here, what is next? I think uh, we did have very little time to explore the landscape of Uncanny Valley together with the brain responses within the VIBE project. I think that uh, with the new AI generated, um, okay, this movie is supposed to, uh, this uh, slide is supposed to be a movie. Um, uh, probably you have seen, this is OpenAI Sora, AI generated movie uh, showing a real human move. Um, it's a collection of, uh, you know, images that has turned into a video. It's all artificially created. And I think this is the next step for the uh, virtual humans and the development of them, the advancement of them. And I think we have a lot of unanswered questions that can be answered using these stimuli. During the time we were doing our project, we didn't have um, this level of maturity of uh, virtual uh, agents' faces, we couldn't create them ourselves because as you could see, to have a very high fidelity agent, you need to have all these cameras in the room, do the photog photogrammetry, do the rendering, you need a team of people. But I think with AI generated uh, faces and human behavior, you can uh, create lots of uh, stimuli and continue this research in order to understand what is it exactly in terms of the appearance, in terms of the behavior, and above all, in terms of the um, uh, 
uh, the, the, the personality and affective uh, relationships that these agents develop with the people that contribute to the Uncanny Valley. Thank you so much for listening. Um, this research was done in collaboration with Professor Max Lauerse and Dr. Julia Leitinati. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much um, for your talk. If there are any questions, the time now uh, is now for you to, to ask questions that you may have. Are there any questions? Yeah? The, ex uh, the experiments you made there, they're all, I, I assume they all were made with flat pitches. To, to Did you also have ex experiments with 3D? Uh, three-dimensional pitches? No, we did not do 3D uh, faces. Um, we only uh, work with 2D still images. Uh, we actually did have one study where we tried to create facial expressions for these agents and understand, so investigate the perception of emotion in the face. I did not include them in this slide because of the lack of time. Uh, but indeed, probably one direction to go forward is to have uh, more of this uh, 3D stimuli that people can look at. At the time when we were doing this, um, there was not e any evidence even working with uh, still uh, 2D images. and the effect it has on the brain. So we started with a simple uh, stimuli, but I think it can grow from there. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I saw a hand, hand here. Yeah. Um, yeah, you said that there are differences between men and women in recognizing it because uh, women t tend to have a <laughs> smoother skin due to makeup. So I was wondering if there was a difference between women who wear makeup and women who don't wear makeup. Um, so is not wearing make not wearing makeup making <laughs> looking more human to us. Um, so the images we use, they were all natural looking uh, humans without makeup. So all the images we had, they were like just raw faces. Um, so once we smoothened the texture of that image, it might have looked like they were wearing just makeup, and it, it's normally. Um, you know, more acceptable for a female face to have a smoother skin than it is for a male skin. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Just a second. Um, I was wondering, uh, building on the question of the uh, uh, person in front, um, did you see that difference too when you uh, separated the two, like the, the shiny eyes and the skin? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, if I go back in the slides, we actually had four conditions in the experiment. In one of the conditions, nothing changed. In one condition, only skin changed. In another condition, only eyes changed. And in one condition, both changed. And um, so for the no changed and the two feature changed, um, we found that people were very good at telling the difference between the humans and the artificial faces, but when only one of them was different, we didn't, we, they were, like, they had a poorer performance in telling them apart. For males and uh, females separately? Uh, or oh, for, for males and uh, females. Um, I think the statistical analysis we did was, um, Julia is here, did, did you do it condition specific, the male and female? <laughs> Sorry. Um, it was the effect of gender. So in general, it was in all four conditions. With the, this condition that had four levels mm -hmm. um, with the gender. Um, a bit, if I may, on the sort of the uh, kind of smoothness of the female and male um, and explanation. So, yes, uh, we could say that maybe, yeah, women tend to wear more makeup, yes, yeah, one the explanation, but actually I think uh, maybe a um, more plausible one is that overall, physically, uh, it has been found that female faces are naturally, they are lighter in texture, skin texture, um, and also this lightness and, and color in you, probably also what contributes to uh, a bit like um, artificial 
well not artificialness but it's easier to probably spot whereas uh, male faces they have darker naturally darker uh, skin and um, yeah basically if you put even the same uh, form the face and you have uh, uh, just you change the hue darker versus uh, lighter uh, people tend to say that the lighter face is the female face so we uh, our actually the brain also makes this distinction um, so I think that this is a more plausible likely more plausible explanation for why we found this yeah thank you I don't know if your question was answered eventually yeah First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. I was just curious, looking at all those uh, pictures, yeah, how far is uh, AI now integrated into detailed analysis of the brain, for instance, or that part of it? Because we see now currently already with MRI, et cetera, that there will be on a picture level already details. So the more detailed information you can collect from an MRI scan or fMRI, whatever, then you get more better interpretation on where it comes from and clear analysis. I was just curious and where do we look from there on ahead? So if I understand the question is to what extent AI is being used nowadays for uh, processing of neuroimaging data. Um, I can tell a lot uh, that has to do more with the pre-processing of these images. Um, so to just give you a bit of context, um, I don't use fMRI, but I use a lot of uh, EEG um, data. Both are kind of similar that you get a lot of noise when you collect such data from the brain. So there are the responses that you want to focus on and the responses you just want to discard. Um, it could be due to movement, to processing of an unrelated um, um, stimuli. Um, and um, most of the algorithms right now we have that are pre-developed help us a lot with the pre-processing stage. However, when it comes to actual feature extraction, the features that we are interested in, I think for the, for, to, to be really, um, to have reliable results, we still do it manually. So we really go through data one by one. And uh, once the data is clean, we decide, okay, at what stage we want to, um, to um, like what sort of window we want to look at, what sort of response, the, what, what is the maximum, the minimum of the response, the range we want to decide. Those are the things that the researcher decides and conducts manually right now. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, another one. <laughs> oh. um, I was wondering if you also looked into age um, next to race and uh, gender? We did not because the data set that we had at hand um, was not so much diverse in terms of the face ages. So most, most of the faces were sort of young looking faces. Um, although I have to say that these days I see a lot of agents being developed with different age range. So now we have like even uh, kids, agents of kids and um, artificial faces of um, young adults and older adults. And particularly with um, older adults, like older faces, I think it's really important that there is investment there because, um, for example, when it comes to healthcare domain and the application of having like a nurse or a doctor or, um, you know, a trainer being um, uh, a simulated avatar, the perception of age actually does matter there. Like you generally trust someone that um, is, is older, you can you associate that with more experience. So it's really important to have that diversity of the faces that are artificially being generated. Any other questions or I think that's it, right? Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was wondering to what extent we could apply the uh, Uncle Valley concept to, for example, discourse or language. Um, language. Um, can, can you be more specific? Like when, for example, what the person says does not match yeah, we how got they a, look? Yeah, we got a whole load now of conversational uh, agent and we could assess sometimes that, yeah, this do, does not lo sound or feel like human because of discourse features and not because of voices or like uh, with your work, uh, uh, facial features. Yeah. So I, I was wondering whether it was actually studied. Maybe it's maybe beyond your 
your uh, background and uh, field of, of study? Actually, that's a very good question. I did have one a student that looked into the mismatch between the voice and the face, the appearance of the face. Uh, so not necessarily the content of what was being communicated. Um, so we created four conditions where we had um, the very natural looking human, the avatar that was created by the Vibe project, and then a now robot. I don't know if you have seen the now robot. It looks like a small, cute robot. And then we synthesized two types of voices, um, the very robotic, like the uh, yeah, robotic like um, sound and the uh, human like voice. And then we mixed all this. So we had one condition, human face, human-like voice, human face, robotic voice, robot face, human-like voice, and then robot uh, face, robotic voice. And then they did a task together with this uh, robot that was sort of like a recognition task, this agent, sorry, this agent, um, that was a recognition task that was supposed to tap into the level of their trust toward this agent. The agent was supposed to give them a recommendation and they had the choice to either take the recommendation or not. And we looked at uh, what they told us in terms of like how much they liked the agent and also uh, how much they took in how many trials they took the recommendation from the agent. Um, the result we found didn't show any significant effect. So at least at this point, from what we had, we expected that a mismatch between the voice and the face would affect people's like uh, perception and their uh, trusting behavior. Our experiment could not yield such result, and we have a number of explanation. Maybe the agent we used was not very human-like, so actually the synthetic voice did not really feel too uncanny on top of the, uh, when it was played on the agent. But I think this is a still an open question that needs more research. Okay. So you uh, could maybe do that in the future? <laughs> <No>? <laughs> Okay, um, I think that's it for questions from the audience. I also had one final uh, question for you, uh, because you studied it for, for many years now, looking into the Uncanny Valley. And I think nowadays technology is more and more able to, to mimic uh, human traits in a, in a very uh, good way. Do you think, you also mentioned it briefly, that we can ever overcome, completely overcome the Uncanny Valley? Will we, will we get there? Yeah, I absolutely think we will get there. I even thought like when I watched some of the recent animated uh, movies, um, Alita being one of them, I was um, quite impressed by the level of uh, sophistication and, and development. However, you need to know that um, all the movements of the agent in that um, movie were created by an actual actor. So that's why they look so natural. So biological motions being created by a human and then copied to an agent. I think what we need to do, for example, the AI models being um, at the forefront of this development is that by collecting multiple videos of humans doing different movement, they can create, they can um, transfer such knowledge, such a skill to a new animated agent. So you don't really actually have to have an actor that plays the movement so that you can have biological motion for the uh, agent. The agent can um, have a simulated action on their own using the AI. So I think it's going really fast and I have a lot of um, yeah, uh, good hope for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.